Hello everybody! In today's process video I'm going to show you how I went from this concept sketch to this painting. For this video I'm going to be painting while you listen to me answer your questions about art. But if you're interested in learning more about how I did this painting and want to listen to me talk through all of my strategies and show you step by step you can get that video over on Patreon. I will put a link in the description below. So today's video is going to be a Q&A and a process video. So I'm going to let you watch the gouache painting somewhere and I'll answer some of your questions kind of like we did last time. I tried to organize the questions a little bit better this time, so hopefully it'll be like an easy transition between them. I asked you guys if you had any questions on YouTube as well as Discord and maybe even Instagram, um, and I tried to compile them. And There were actually a lot of duplicate questions, uh, so hopefully I, I got all of them in here, but of course if I missed yours just comment below and I'll answer it in the comments. Let's jump straight into it. So question one, what do you think are the necessary colors to have in your palette? Um, well, so if you're using a transparent medium, the most important would probably be red, yellow, blue, the primary colors. And you can vary those, like you can have a variation of red and of yellow and of blue to your taste because like I personally would never use cadmium red or like a super vibrant like fire truck red <laughs> in my landscapes unless I was painting a red poppy flower and even then I tend to lean more towards a more earthy tone so within the family of red and yellow and blue there are so many choices and I just recommend that you lean whichever way your aesthetic takes you so like I said, I lean more towards something that's a little more earthy and not quite so um, just in your face. So if I had to ch only choose three colors, this would be something I would consider. It's more like a CMYK kind of approach, but you have a vibrant yellow, although this one leans a little bit um, more like lemon yellow. It's a Hansa yellow. I have my Anthraquinone blue, which is uh, my new favorite blue. It's so gorgeous and quinacridone magenta and the reason I would go with these is because it just gives me so much variety it doesn't like pigeonhole me into being only more muted and more earthy if I want to I can go really really bold but it, I also have the option to go more muted depending on how I mix things or if I had the choice and I could add a few other colors I would definitely add like a phthalo blue or a phthalo green because when I'm mixing turquoises for like coastal scenes. I want something a little more vibrant and turquoisey and those are the those two colors are really helpful. And if you can add one more, uh, I would probably go with neutral tint, which is just like a gray color and used r really thick. It would just be black. Uh, but mixed with other colors, I just love how it acts I love how it moves and how it mixes and it's not overpowering. It's just a fun color. These are the colors that are in my palette. So as you can see, I have way more than three. You guys might recognize this if you've seen my recent video about making my new watercolor palette and reducing the toxic paints that are in my palette. And as you can see, there are a few really vibrant colors on here, but not too many. I wanted to have a variety in my palette and I did want to have a few vibrant colors in case I need them, uh, but for the most part most of these are just really really perfect for my aesthetic for the type of landscapes I like to paint. And when I'm talking about more earthy tones this is a mixing chart using pyroline violet. So sometimes I only use pyroline violet instead of any other reddish tone because it when it mixes with other colors, I feel like it gives me more really just muted tones or earthy tones or jewel-like tones, something that feels like it came straight from the earth. So, you know, you can pick a color like this and not even choose a red. It just totally depends on what you're looking for. If you are painting with gouache or an opaque medium, 
you're also going to want black and white because they are more necessary for mixing certain tones and you're also going to be really frustrated if you don't have white. You could probably live without black, but if you don't have white, it's going to be extremely difficult to paint some of the lighter um, and more grayed out tones, especially for gouache. Next question, how do you narrow down on your palette and lighting from your reference image? Okay, so looking at a reference photo, how do I choose what colors I'm using and what kind of lighting I'm using? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's the question. So I usually approach it from an emotional standpoint. Like if I'm going to the coast and it's a sunny day, it makes me happy. It makes me want to jump into the ocean and I just feel a lot of energy and just really good vibes from it. So I lean more towards using my brighter tones. Those things just go hand in hand for me. I also love turquoise. <laughs> And using a bright blue and a green and turquoise for my coasts just makes me really, really happy. If I'm painting a spooky or maybe a misty day, like in a forest, I would probably lean more towards those earthy tones, like um, more of a muted green, maybe mix in more of my neutral tint, and just kind of use the colors that I think represent something that's more subdued, something that gives you maybe more of a, not necessarily, I don't really paint spooky stuff, but you kind of see what I'm saying. Um, so it's all about your emotional connection to your colors. And in terms of lighting, I do invent my lighting quite a bit. So I will maybe start with a photo that was taken on a uh, overcast day and so there really isn't any strong lighting in there there's nothing like no direct sunlight and no dramatic shadows but i love dramatic shadows so a lot of times i will just choose a light source direction and add in my own shadows um, of course if i am trying to go with like a serene or foggy scene i'm not gonna do that but it it's a lot of fun to invent your own lighting and it's also a really good practice because if you can just visualize it and practice painting what you visualize you're gonna increase your ability to be able to paint without references although that although you know there's nothing wrong with painting from references I highly recommend it it helps you learn so much don't let anyone make you feel bad about using reference next question do you use the same colors in your travel palette as you do in your studio paintings? Mostly yes, because I have set up, my gear is set up in a way that makes it possible to use it in and out of the studio. For instance, this is my palette. This is my studio palette. I don't have one of those big, heavy, fancy ceramic palettes that I see everyone using, which I think are awesome, by the way. Um, but for that, for me, it just doesn't work because I have one desk and I'm constantly switching between watercolor and gouache and oil painting and pencil and like everything. And I'm also always clearing off the desk to take photos and do stuff. So it just wouldn't work for me if I have a one of those big clunky palettes. So this, I mean, it's foldable, it seals up, I can shut it, I can toss it in my backpack and I can go outside and paint with this. However, most of the time I want a simpler or a smaller setup when I'm outside because I just think simplifying it, it, it makes things a little easier. So I'll use a smaller palette like this, which you've probably also seen in some of my videos. And the colors in here change maybe every couple months. Um, more recently I've been sticking with the same colors because I have this new palette that I've been really trying to get used to and I love it by the way uh, so I haven't changed them out but sometimes I'll um, throw in like a this is actually white gouache and so sometimes I'll mix watercolor and gouache on the go uh, it just depends on what I'm going for if I'm doing oil painting I pretty much only bring the primaries when I'm going outside because oil painting takes up way more space and it's way heavier and I don't want to bring all of my tubes of paint when I'm going outside to lugging all my equipment around. And with gouache, you've probably seen lately that I have been using a sealable palette. So this allows me to paint with gouache more thickly, 
much easier to just whip this out, get painting. And I also just recently bought these, which are also sealable palettes. However, they have less um, wells in them, obviously. So I would use like a smaller selection of colors. And honestly, I'm leaning in this direction lately because I don't know why, but I'm at this point with my planner painting that I almost feel like it's my first time going out. If I have all of my colors with me, I want to use all of my colors and then I just overwhelm myself. So if I have less colors, I feel like I stick with the I stick with my foundational knowledge. It's more of a simple approach and I don't get overwhelmed with all the colors. It's, it allows me to focus on the scene a little bit more. So I'm going to try these out and let you guys know how it goes. And if it goes well, I will share where I got them and, and how and all of that. And next, do you have a set of brushes that you take with you versus using in the studio? Yeah, I have a lot of brushes. So this is one of my jars of brushes out of five. I have five full jars of brushes. This, I try to like organize them like this is watercolor and I have another one for gouache and another one for oil. Just makes it a little easier. But usually what I do, I have my favorite brushes and I don't care if I'm outside, I will use my favorite brushes outside. I once almost lost my favorite silver black velvet brush and I was devastated and I made Wolfie go back out with me into the forest and look for it and we searched for over an hour and we were looking in the river and like following the river to see if it washed down shore. Turns out it was shoved down in the bottom of my backpack. Sorry Wolfie. <laughs> But after that point, I just became much more conscious of my equipment and I carry them all in a brush roll like this. So you just slide the brush in there and you roll it up and it keeps it from like you can't bend this. So it keeps you from accidentally stepping on your brushes <laughs> and cracking them in half. It also is very visible like like I notice this anywhere it goes. And I have not lost a single brush since I started using this years ago. In terms of what brushes I choose when I go outside, I just do that based on size. So, you know, just using one larger brush all the way down to a teeny script brush so I can get really thin sweeping lines if I need to. But I've noticed that when I am outside painting, I'm not going to spend as much time on my painting. I'm going to be working really quickly and sometimes I don't even change my brush, I'll, maybe once. And so having something that's a little bit smaller to mid-size like this, like a number 12 round, is perfect. And a lot of times I'll do a, all the whole painting or multiple paintings with just one brush. Honestly, like if you can just make your plein air painting gear, your setup as simple as possible, it will be so much better. I can't even tell you how many times I've gone out with tons of stuff and I get so flustered or I have all these high expectations for myself and it's just a total bust. And then other times I go out with like just this, one piece of paper, one brush, and I paint something that I am totally in love with because it was simple. It let me just focus on the scene. It wasn't overwhelming in any way. <laughs> so I don't know, it's maybe just psychological or maybe it's just me. Okay, do you use multiple sketchbooks at the same time? I have seen other artists use one with lower quality paper for rough sketches and ideas, written notes, etc., and then the best quality one for actual paintings. But then others, but then others do everything in one sketchbook. Do you use another one other than your Arches homemade sketchbook, which is awesome by the way. Thank you <laughs> uh, for notes or impressions. No, because I don't need to use more than one with this because I did the thing, the thing. So this is the sketchbook that you're referring to. This is the one I have the video about of how I made it. And there is my favorite paper in here, the Arches cold press. 140 pound, like super nice paper. And in the back, I have a bunch of toned paper. I also used to have some hot press paper, but I already used all of that. And so I don't need more than one sketchbook. I just need this because this is where I do all of my notes or my little 
value studies like this or just scribble around or get warmed up if I need to. This is my way of making things as simple as possible for myself. There's no reason you can't have more than one sketchbook outside unless you are hiking and you don't want to carry a lot of stuff then I can totally understand avoiding that. So if you're in the same boat as me and you want to have everything in one contained unit something like this is super easy to make. If I can make it, you can make it. I'll link the video of how I did it and you can go check it out and learn from my mistakes. Okay, here's a doozy. What are some of the best ways to level up? Practice every day, of course, but which drills and strategies do you think work well to improve skills, especially with watercolor? I'm still in parentheses. I'm still dealing with blooms and hard edges and I'm but I'm getting better, yay. And basic drawing skills. I still struggle a little with proportion, even though I know how to measure, etc. Okay. <laughs> okay, this could be like a really big answer. The simple answer for me, how I level up, is that I just paint and I draw every single day, constantly. And even back in the day when I had my full-time job and I was streaming and I was doing all the things at once, I still did it. I still found a way <laughs> either by probably avoiding sleep. I don't, I, I didn't used to sleep a lot. Um, like I always found a way to incorporate it into my day. That's like the typical thing, like keep doing it but you have to do it properly. <laughs> so by that, I mean, practice doesn't make perfect. Practicing smart and practicing the right things in the right way makes you perfect. Although you know, no one's perfect. So what I do along the way while I'm painting and drawing every day, experimenting. One thing I learn a lot from experimenting. I learn a lot from my mistakes and I'm constantly observing other art, other artists, the way that other artists work through videos, through their social media. Lately, I've actually started taking a few online courses with some instructors uh, that are focused on certain things that I'm interested in. A lot of artists are now going online and some of my favorite artists are offering these like quick three hour workshops on the weekend and I've been able to do a couple, which has been amazing. But if you're on your own journey and you're not doing anything like that, you still want to learn from people that you look up to. So one simple way is that you can do master studies. And I've talked about this in another video, I think a gouache video, and I'll link it. But basically, um, taking, finding images, finding paintings that you admire, something that captivates you, that takes your breath away, that oh, you just like want to stare at for 24 hours, um, print it out or put it up on your computer and try to copy it, try to paint it. And by doing that, I remember someone told me that it's like the only way you're ever going to have a conversation with that artist. Cause in a lot of the, the art that I really admire is from a long time ago. So the artists are no longer alive. And it's like having a direct conversation with that artist. So if you copy, if you try to like see how they painted the sky and you try to do it on your paper, something happens in your mind where you're like, why am I putting white here? Oh, that's why. Or like, why am I adding blue to this cloud? They added blue to their cloud. Like this was weird. But then at the end of the painting, you realize, oh, like that made it look shadowy and beautiful. Like you, you just kind of figure out these things as you do it. And do that multiple times, do it every once in a while, maybe do it once a month or something, give yourself a little challenge. And it is so incredibly valuable. I have learned so much by doing that over the years. Um, I haven't done it in a long time and I kind of miss it. I want to do it again. <laughs> maybe we could do like a live stream of that. Of course, you don't ever want to copy an artwork and post it and say that it's yours and say that you invented it or say that or, or sell prints of it or anything like that. It is literally purely just for learning. Keep it to yourself. I mean, feel free to share it, but like as you just got to give them credit and you got to say, this was a study. I am doing this to learn. I take no credit. No, you cannot buy a print of this. So again, based on my experience, some drills that help me are 
doing a value study before I do a color version of a landscape. So again, I have a video of this and I'll link it, but basically what that does is it gets you into the mindset of thinking about the lighting first and the values of the scene, which to, in my opinion, and I guess a lot of artists opinion is the most important thing, because if you don't do proper values, no matter what colors you use, it's not going to work. It's going to be flat. It's going to be lack. It's going to lack depth. It's going to lack anything useful for the viewer to get like into the scene. So practicing those values is just hugely important. And the reason I like doing the value study and then the color version next to it is because I'm constantly referencing the value study as well as my photo reference or whatever. And a lot of times if I went straight from the reference photo into the color version of the painting, I am not thinking about the values as much. But if I have that little value study there, I'm often surprised like, wow, I didn't really think about how that one thing is much darker than this thing. And it helps me stay on track. And I actually learned that exercise from doing Nathan Fowkes's schoolism class uh, about watercolor and gouache painting landscape. You can go find it on schoolism. <laughs> and I'm not sponsored. I just loved that class and I love Nathan's work. So that strategy has helped me a lot and I've been trying to incorporate that into my workflow for everything I do. And one more drill that I will suggest, and you might think I'm absolutely crazy, but if, if this is for landscape painters, <laughs> I really recommend doing figure drawing. And the reason for that is because figure drawing, figure drawing and portraits are so unforgiving. If you draw a face wrong, if you draw a body wrong, you get the one of the body parts wrong. It is so obvious and it really, really helps you practice or forces you to be more aware of perspective and scale and just fluid gestures and so many things that are important. Doing figure drawing helps me train my eye very intensely in a totally different way than doing landscapes. And what I learn with figure drawing is applicable to landscapes or anything that I draw. If you are just absolutely against figures and portraits, and trust me, I get it because I <laughs> get so frustrated when I'm doing it, even though it's really good for me, I will suggest that you at least paint or draw still life setups. So just like throw a bowl of fruit somewhere, even just draw your jar of brushes because that's going to do something similar and it's going to train you to start seeing proportions. It's going to train you to see depth and perspective and so many things that are going to be extremely valuable for landscapes. I mean, I guess when it comes down to it, like the most basic advice that I would say what works for me and what I've seen work for so many people and what a lot of the top artists in the landscape world will tell you if they take your their workshop is that you need to develop your drawing skills and by that it's like practice drawing every day do sketches of your scenes do drawings of your scenes draw landscapes and paint landscapes simultaneously so if you're interested in that, but you don't know where to start, I have a bunch of Skillshare classes about drawing and painting landscapes for beginners. And I approach it in a very fun and like lighthearted way so that if you are a total beginner, it just kind of opens your mind up to how you can start drawing landscapes. What are the things that you could, you can work on? And I give you like little exercises you can do and you can get it for free by using the link in my description. Moving on. How often do you go out to sketch in a week? I go out one to five times. Some weeks I don't go out at all. It's very sad. I don't like those weeks, but life and business and stuff happens and you just can't do what you want to do all the time. <laughs> but I do find that when I keep my go bag, my plein air painting bag ready at all times, I've got all my gear in there. I just need to like throw some water in there and maybe a couple little things. If I do that, I go out way more often and I'm always so thankful for past Sarah for like helping me do that. <laughs> 
Honestly, you just gotta make it as easy as possible on yourself. Final question is, any tips for taking good photos for social media? I have tips. Okay, without going too much in depth into it, I really recommend finding an artist you love who takes beautiful photos who when you see their photos on Instagram or wherever you're like wow that's amazing like I want to do that find those and figure out how they do it like what see what they put in the shot a lot of times like the really cool shots that I like have brushes and paints off to the side of the painting and they shoot it like straight down and then they'll shoot it at an angle and I find myself doing that more and more and I love how it kind of showcases the artwork in a different way rather than just cropping into the image. Uh, but one of the most important things is probably lighting. If you have really bad lighting, it's a, it's such a turnoff and it makes your art look awful. And it's going to probably make you, it's probably going to hurt you more than it'll help you to post something like that. So I always use natural light, even if I paint something and it's like, 8 p.m. and I'm like this is the best thing I've ever painted I want to take a photo and share it right now I will slap myself and I'll say no wait until the following morning in the sunlight not direct sunlight I usually take it in my windowsill where I get like ambient light and I'll make sure I get that beautiful natural light because it just makes the colors sing it makes them so beautiful and enjoyable and it puts it in the best light yeah, I said it. Okay, that was everything. Thank you guys for joining me. If you want a full version of this painting that you've been watching along with me, it's over on my Patreon along with full narration and explanation about how I did it. All right, I'll see you guys next time.